In this talk, um, I think I may have overdone the philosophy a bit in the first half before we get to the AI, but I, I somehow feel that's necessary because this is one of those topics where the, uh, the AI owes a lot to older problems, older statements of problems in philosophy, and you can't really understand one without the other. There's a famous remark by a man called Christopher Longit Higgins many, many years ago where he said, parodying Clausewitz on war, that artificial intelligence is the pursuit of metaphysics by other means. And nothing shows the truth of that more than this topic. So uh, that's why, I'm, without apology, I sort of have to run you through some, um, run you through some philosophy and I'll try to make it as painless as possible. <coughs> so what the talk's about. Um, what is consciousness and why is it a philosophical problem, given that it now seems to be? What's it got to do with AI? And then, of course, the sort of the, the $64,000 questions. Um, uh, could AI entities be conscious? How would we go about making them so? If we're, were we to want to? Would it matter if they were? How would we know if they were? And so on. Um, starting point. Um, back to the early 20th century, I mean, you have to see right away that consciousness is a topic that has always divided people, thinkers, absolutely. There's two roughly contemporary great thinkers, William James, the American psychologist, and Sigmund Freud, who you know about. Um, look at them. I mean, James, consciousness is the name of a non-entity and has no right to a place among first principles. Siggy, what is meant by consciousness we need not discuss. It's beyond all doubt. So there you go. I mean, you know, these, these men were both powerful and intellects. There, there isn't a, there, as you'll see as we go on, there's not agreement about consciousness at all. And that's why it's mysterious. That's why it's interesting. Also remember, it's not a traditional philosophical problem. I mean, you know, you've got those Oxford dons who say all philosophical problems go back to Plato and Aristotle. Well, this one doesn't. I mean, this is something that traditional philosophers did not discuss. They didn't have a word for it, I doubt. I doubt if they had a word for it. Um, which is an interesting fact. I mean, it certainly doesn't fit into the budget of traditional philosophical problems. In fact, till recently, it wasn't possible to discuss it in Anglosphere philosophy. Um, and yet, David Chalmers, a very distinguished philosopher, British philosopher, says, it is the hard problem. Why does he say that? Well, we'll get to that. Chalmers' position, just in passing, I mean, is that, just so you know, a sort of a solid position at the beginning, that even a complete specification of a creature in physical terms, the brain, every detail, every neuron, would leave unanswered the question of whether or not the creature is conscious. So he's taken by that remark, by his calling it the hard problem, to be a sort of defender of the interest and what people would normally call the irreducibility of consciousness to states of the brain. Um, is consciousness a historical phenomenon? Um, we'll come back to this at the end, but it's worth thinking about. I mean, were, silly question. Were Plato and Shakespeare as conscious as us? They didn't mention it. Of course, they were in some sense. I mean, you can't read, the, you can't read Shakespeare and not think he was pretty much like us. I mean, he'd be a good guy to have to lunch. Um, but they didn't talk about it. They didn't have a word for it. I mean, the real word we have for it is a gift of the Germans. It's it's Hegel's use of the word Bewusstsein, and Hegel really got this word into into circulation. And it's it's, it's never looked back on the continent. Um, it's it's, a, it's been a continental philosophical topic ever since. Not until recently an Anglosphere topic. If you worry about problems like Brexit, you'll realise that Brexit issues go much deeper than trade agreements. They go back to things like what can be said in philosophy and what can't. We can say the things Americans can say and Australians can say, but we wouldn't until recently have dreamt of saying the things the Germans and the French said. They wouldn't be discussable. Um, James is a very interesting writer. I don't know if you've come across him. Julian James. He wrote this book about the origins of consciousness, and it's an interesting idea he has, which may not be true, but it's certainly stimulating. He has this idea that consciousness emerged in evolutionary time in human beings, and that it was after the origin of la after language began, after we began to talk, and then we began to talk to ourselves in our heads. And his line is that um, early man was so shocked by finding he talked to himself in his head, he thought, God, who's this? This must be God speaking to me. Who's this person in my head talking to me? And he thinks that the Old Testament prophets, the, the great Isaiahs and Ezekiels that we have, are early statements of consciousness of someone talking to themselves and only able to explain it as God talking to them. It's an interesting idea. I'm not backing it. You couldn't back it or not back it. It's, it's certainly a fascinating idea about how consciousness may have come into being. What's interesting about it for me is I, I certainly do believe that consciousness has something to do with language. We'll get to that right at the end. Chalmers' hard problem. Um, he thinks the easy problems are things like 
perception, uh, vision. Uh, he thinks these are now explainable by physiologists. Consciousness, he thinks, is hard because it's not. Because, and this is kind of vacuous, what people are reduced to saying is, consciousness is a state of being like this. Me looking at you now, you looking at me. Woo! I mean, it doesn't help. It doesn't help, does it? It's sort of, it's reducing it to a triviality, which is real, but there's nothing to say. Um, people use phrases like, what's it like to be us? Famous papers have had titles like, what's it like to be a bat? It started with bats, it's gone on to other things. Um, and people use the word qualia for it. That doesn't help me much. Qualia just renames the problem as it was a moment ago. Um, it's mysterious. We know what it is. We know what we're talking about. Freud's right. We know what it is. But explaining it, saying anything more about it, and I'm going to take another 40 or 40 minutes, but so you can say more about it. But, I mean, it's hard not to be vacuous. I, um, uh, the professor of philosophy, when I was a student, used to say that philosophy was always at risk of raising flags to signal the arrival of the obvious. And again, we're there, aren't we? I mean, we have to be careful here. Um, so Chalmers is, is on the front of those people who think that consciousness is not explicable by brain causes. He, he doesn't deny that consciousness rests on brain machinery. He just doesn't think it's sufficient to explain what it is and its nature. Um, of course, the good old starting point for all this discussion is Descartes. Descartes, you remember, 17th century, said that the world had two substances. It had mental substances and physical substances, and the brain was... was I'm not sure he talked about the brain much, because they didn't really realize the brain was where the mind was. Uh, but that there was physical stuff that we were, and there was mental stuff that we were, and we functioned by these two kinds of stuff somehow interlinking in a, by a mysterious way, and Descartes' philosophy is all about how the two substances link. That's a starting point, because most of the people we're going to be talking about deny that. Descartes the man you, you aren't, the man you deny, uh, whose theory you deny to get into this game. Uh, much more interesting for us really is Leibniz. Leibniz, the man who Bertrand Russell said was probably the cleverest man who's ever lived. And he's, of course, he's a great bridge to AI. Leibniz was the first man to think about um, thinking and reasoning machines, machines that could reason and settle debates. So he's a bridge to AI, but also right on this issue of consciousness, he, he talk, he's got this wonderful image of walking into a mill and looking at its works and seeing everything working from inside, but you, you, you never quite understand what it's for or what it's doing just by looking at all this whirring going on. Uh, let, me, let me show you his words. Well, you don't really want me to read all those out, do you? But you get the idea. There it is. It must be confessed, this is Leibniz in the 17th century. I mean, this man is an extraordinary person. Um, it must be confessed that perception and that which depends on it, and perception will do for consciousness here, more or less, are inexplicable mechanical causes, those by figures and motions. And supposing there were a mechanism so constructed as to think, feel, and have perception, we might enter into it as into a mill. And this granted, we should only find on visiting it pieces which push one against the other, but never anything by which to explain a perception. This must therefore be sought not in the composition or in the machine. Um, there is Leibniz, the monodology, if you, the great, the great, possibly one of the greatest philosophical works ever written. There he is, big hair guy. Okay, he's a bridge to AI. Leibniz wanted to have a thinking machine. He wanted an artificial language for reasoning in, which is such a modern idea for most AI people think they thought it up. They thought it, that idea came with logic. No, no, Leibniz was onto this. He thought, if only we could use this artificial language for reasoning in, which he designed one, um, then there'd be no more wars or struggles in the world, no more religious problems. All we'd have to do would be to argue in this artificial language of reason and everything would become clear. Mad dreaming, of course, but, but what a fantastic idea. Okay. The monodology, that book of which I showed you the frontispiece. This is crucial to understanding the bridge to AI. The doctrine of the monodology is completely mad, but remains attractive. This is what the monodology says. The whole universe consists of monads. Us, God, my toes, this machine, uh, the floor. Everything is a monad, and everything is conscious in its way. Some things are very dimly conscious. Stones, not much. Uh, us a bit, God, everything. And monads are closed. They're really, everything's inside them. They don't interact. 
the world perceives my mona as just running their own life inside but we have the feeling that we can see what's going on in other monads my monad thinks it knows what's going on in your monad it may be right it may be wrong but this is an extraordinary idea we'll come back to this when we talk about ai because he was onto something extraordinary here okay because god is the main monad who is completely clear and sees everything in every other monad well doesn't know he doesn't see it in the other monads he knows what's in the other monad because he knows everything <coughs> The idea that all things are conscious, this is an important idea for the first half of this lecture. We'll keep coming back to it. <clears throat> so there's been a huge change in Anglosphere philosophy. I mean, um, suddenly, I, I want to say it's like joining the European Union. It really is. Uh, you couldn't talk about consciousness in English-speaking philosophy. And then suddenly, um, British philosophers woke, and some Americans, but mostly British, woke up to the fact that Continental's been talking about consciousness for a century and thought, oh, we can do that too. And they joined it. They joined it. They actually joined the, as it were, the European Union of talking about, and I'm not joking. I mean, look at Francis Crick, the inventor of DNA. This is Crick, 20, 30 years ago. Um, recommended never to mention the term consciousness in a grant application or it would be refused. That tells you how things were. That's the sort of, that's the Brexit spirit of, uh, of consciousness. Okay. So it was, it was a, everything that was necessarily private was not discussable really by philosophy. So Wittgenstein, a name I've mentioned in these lectures before, Wittgenstein hovered over all the time over what was private. Pain. You can't feel my pain, I can't feel yours. So philosophy can't talk about it. Another disciple of his called Norman Malcolm talked about dreams. Dreams are essentially private, therefore they don't exist. Malcolm thought dreams didn't exist. Dreams were just what people said when they woke up, which is a nice idea, isn't it? I mean, because we could tell what they said when they woke up, but we couldn't tell anything about their dreams. So it was a complete rejection in English-speaking philosophy of the private. Above all, they rejected the idea that a language could be spoken by just one person, which I have no views on that. Only continentals talked about experience and consciousness, and that con consciousness was essentially attention to something. Meanwhile, as I say, in the e over in the EU, whoo, I mean, since Hegel, it's, uh, it's been field day. I mean, um, Aristotle, before Leibniz and Leibniz, as I said, thought that there was consciousness in everything. Um, Hegel's Bewusstsein was... It's hard to explain what Bewusstsein is. I do love the word, though, so I keep saying it. Um, Bewusstsein is us, humans, as the piece of the universe which is becoming conscious. It's an extraordinary idea, if you've never heard it before, that we, corporately, are the universe as a whole becoming conscious. It's not completely crazy. I mean, we probably are the only conscious bit of the universe. There doesn't seem to be anybody else out there. It's us, okay? So when we're all gone, the universe won't have any consciousness at all, probably. So he's on to something, isn't he? We're, and for Hegel, this isn't about individual consciousness. He thinks we only are conscious in respect to each other. We are a sort of a conscious totality in some way. Um, Spinoza in the 17th century thought that the, the whole world was a single conscious thing. So in other words, Hegel was in a sense also part of that. And Teilhard de Chardin, if you know that name, the famous French religious thinker who pushed this same idea, as did Jung. Jung, the, psychi the psychoanalyst, that, that there was a collective unconscious that we all had, which was part of our conscious links to each other as a whole thing. Okay. Um, so, the word, there's a word for all that. It's called panpsychism. It used to be a word for laughing at, like Francis Crick would have laughed at it if you'd put it into a lecture or a grant proposal. But nowadays, it's a perfectly respectable word, so I can share it with you. It's, you know, as, as with racism, as with sexism, there are things we can now talk about we couldn't talk about in the past, or vice versa. Um, so, panpsychism is back. Panpsychism means mind is in everything. Everything may be mind, everything may be conscious in its way. This is now a respectable philosophical idea. Um, it's, a, it's like what people, it's a form of what people used to call idealism, but it, it's, it's not the old idealism. This isn't Descartes, it isn't Berkeley, the other philosophers you read about in the past. This modern panpsychism of people like David Chalmers is that um, consciousness is the reality. And they don't mean the physical world isn't real. They mean that the physical world is real and it's conscious, right down to electrons. The, the world consists of consciousness and we sort of in some sense hold it in being by knowing about it. That's the tricky bit to explain. Because I mean, I have this sneaky feeling that if we all disappeared tomorrow in some ghastly sort of uh, you know, asteroid explosion, the world would in a sense go on. But since there'd be nothing conscious in it, 
it's not clear what that would be like either. Okay. Um, so this idea of panpsychism is quite hard for people to accept. You just have to take my word for it. It's now a relatively respectable um, philosophical idea in various forms and is being taken on board by some artificial intelligence people. Um, that, that physical reality can't be separated from the mind. Those of you who know something about quantum physics, though this debate's been going on in quantum physics for 50 years, that somehow the measurements in quantum physics affected the world, that the human mind perceiving things affected the behavior of, of very small particles. So that's not a new idea in physics. It's that idea that were blown up to scale. Now, here's the opposition. Daniel Dennett, the, American, the greatest, the best known American philosopher, the American philosopher who knows most about AI. He's written books about, called Consciousness Explained. He's written books about AI, books about evolution. He's a very articulate and lucid writer. He is the, as it were, the, he's the Anglo-Brexit reaction. He's anti-consciousness. He's against all this continental thought. He's, I think he thinks continental thought is a contradiction in terms, really. Um, yeah. um, Dennett thinks consciousness is basically empty. Uh, there's nothing there, really. In fact, he's following another British philosopher called David Hume. David Hume, if you know his work, Hume said that whenever I look for the self in my side, me, I can't find it. And Dennett is an updating of that. Um, consciousness, he has a lovely image, Dennett, that consciousness is like a public relations officer. A public relations officer gets handed a sheet coming down from the president's office, and he reads it out, but he has no idea where it comes from or he's not responsible for it, he just gets it and reads it out. So Dennett says, our consciousness is a public relations officer. Stuff comes to us, Woo. where does it come from? No idea. <laughs> Brain, nah, it's all going on in there, no idea. It's not, it's not real, it's no, it's no more contentful than the thinking and control of events of a public relations officer. Um, so the, dis dis the modern dispute, moving on from James and Freud, updating the James Freud first slide, is that the issue now is what is real and central? What the core question of metaphysics, what is real? What is central? Then it says experience isn't real, consciousness isn't real. People like Galen Strawson and David Chalmers say it is real and it's the most real thing. It's central to everything. Strawson says um, consciousness is the only thing in the universe whose ultimate intrinsic nature we can claim to know. In other words, we know more about that than anything else. So you see the difference. You see the opposition going on. Um, it's not a new idea that our minds don't know what's really going on underneath. I read Ab Adam Bede the other day, um, George Eliot. There's a lovely passage in Adam Bede. There it is. Look, Adam Bede, 1859. Um, our mental business is carried on in much the same way as the business of the state. A great deal of hard work is done by agents who are not acknowledged. Yeah, George Eliot, right on it. There it is. That's exactly what we're talking about, that we don't know what's going on, what, or what our minds are really doing. We only have access to some superficial form of it. Uh, Freud's unconscious, of course, is a magnification of that. Freud's whole approach to the mind is really that we as the, we as the superego are, are on top. We're the top layer that knows a bit. It's all really going on down in the ego and the id, and the id we know little about, it just drives us, drives us on, but we don't understand why or how. So Dennett is right in that tradition. Uh, just an interesting question on the side, side balloon. Another interesting question Chalmers has, has pushed out there, um, which we'll come back to at the end, is could there be zombies? Zombies being um, beings that are exactly like us in every way, talk like us, look like us, but they aren't conscious. Okay? So they're just like us, but not conscious at all. How could we tell? What could we ask them? It doesn't matter what you ask them. I mean, they'll, they'll say what they say. They can say anything. If you, ask a, if you ask a dialogue, a chatbot, if you ask Siri or Alexa if they're conscious, they probably tell you they are because they've been told to. I mean, it doesn't prove anything, does it? Um, how do I know about your consciousness? I mean, this is the philosophical problem that philosophy professors used to, you know, trade on for donkey's years. I know I'm conscious, but I don't know you're conscious. You don't know that I'm conscious. I mean, because we're a bit similar and made of the same kind of meat, we tend to assume that, well, probably, you know, more or less. We, there are people we have doubts about, of course. But I mean, you know, but, but in general, <laughs> but we argue about, instead about dogs, don't we? There's a passionate dispute about, are dogs conscious? And you know, they're at least as conscious as some of the people we know. Okay, uh, would there be, just in passing, these are balloons before we get to our main thrust again. I mean, um, would there be moral implications for conscious machines? I mean, supposing machines were not zombies. Supposing AI machines 
were conscious, the machines that are going to take over most of our automated labor within the next 50 years, they're doing a great deal of it already, but are going to take over more and more. We all know that if we read the papers. Um, suppose they were conscious. Well, you see, doesn't this, isn't this interesting? Wouldn't that bring back all the Marxist struggles about the exploitation of the proletariat? I mean, we only feel we can exploit machines because they're machines. We feel bad now about exploiting slaves. That's right out. We even feel guilty about exploiting people, house cleaners. People get all kinds of feelings about these things, right? Just supposing it turned out that the great world of automated machines were conscious. It would all come back again, wouldn't it? I mean, wow, we go round the whole cycle again. The revolution, a new revolution of, of the machines. In fact, of course, as you probably know, some science fiction has toyed with this, and it won't quite go away, this new exploited proletariat of regimes. That's just there to lie on the, lay on the table. I have nothing particular to say about that. Another balloon at the side is, could there be different types of consciousness? We tend to assume naively, I do, that we're all conscious in the same way. I'm not sure that's true. I mean, people see color differently, we know that. Men and women see color differently. Uh, there's lots of sophisticated experiments on how people see color. There's lots of sophisticated experiments on how and whether people see optical illusions. People don't, and in fact, we'll come back to that right at the end. Some people have tried to make a test for machine consciousness in terms of optical illusions. They don't, people don't see optical illusions the same way. And so and there does seem to be something about optical illusion of holding the duck and the rabbit in your mind at once in the famous diagram. There is something about consciousness and understanding. I, I think I see the link. I, I'm, and of course, the most impressive thing, for those who doubt we are conscious in the same way, are split brain, brain patients. We won't go on about this. We could take a whole lecture on this. I'm sure you've had Gresham lectures on split brain, brain patients. You cut the corpus callosum between the two parts of the brain. And, of course, one half of the brain, it's that one, isn't it, I think, controls speech. So when you talk to those people, you're only talking to half the brain. So if you show to the other half of the brain, the eyes switch over, of course, you put a piece of cardboard here, and you show the other half of the brain a dirty picture. Uh, the face goes red, and you're talking to the other half of the brain that can't see the picture. And you ask it, why are you, why are you embarrassed? And it makes up some crazy explanation as to why it's embarrassed, because it can't see the picture that the other half of the brain can see, and it's making it embarrassed, physically embarrassed. So, I mean, whatever consciousness means there, it doesn't mean the same as you and me. So I suspect consciousness may not be the same for all people, which if true, of course, lets in dogs, machines, and the possibility of other kinds of things being conscious. Where does AI come in? You may be thinking, isn't it about time he got on to this? Yeah, okay. Um, the classic question is, AI has tossed around for a while. Not an original question, because you saw the philosophers have really been at it. Um, could a machine be conscious, and how would we know it was? We'll come back to that. Um, what kind of programming or AI theory would we perform or create to make it so? The answer is we don't know. But there are some suggestions, and that's what I'm going to play with in the remaining time. Would AI entities be better if they were conscious? Well, we talked about that with the zombies and the possible revolution. The most the first, distinctive AI, I, the first distinctive AI idea about consciousness comes from the great Minsky in MIT, the founder of AI in America, really. Uh, now, they recently dead. Um, Minsky had this idea that AI is basically an attention mechanism. That's not original. The continental philosophers all said that from Husserl onwards. So we don't need to know what the lower levels of our body and mind machines are doing. We don't need to know how we breathe, how we digest. We don't. We don't. If we could control digestion, the world would be completely different. Some gurus, they say, in faraway places, can control their breathing and digestion, but most of us can't. Most of our physical activity, not just the brain, but the body, are, at a, as it were, at a programming level to talk computer talk, below the level we can control or even understand. We've no idea how our digestion works. I mean, as you know, I mean, people, scientists, were wrong about how we breathed for so long. They believed in phlogiston. They went on breathing, but they had a completely wrong theory of breathing. I mean, it didn't stop them breathing. They just were wrong about it, you know. It was just almost the opposite of what actually happens in the lungs. So, as it were, um, they didn't know. They knew nothing. They knew worse than nothing. Um, they knew the wrong thing. Um, so, by definition, a consciousness in machines or humans would have to be partial. We can't know everything our entity is doing by definition. Uh, you can't imagine an entity that was conscious all the time, a machine or a person, of all its functions, all its suggestion, everything it did. If I reach out for a glass of water, 
my mind doesn't know and doesn't want to know how the nerves and the muscles of my arm work. I'd stand paralyzed if I did that. It would probably only work because I don't. It only works because I don't. So that's Minsky, the idea that Minsky's onto, that consciousness in humans and their possibly machines is something that protects us, separates us from a great deal of the functioning of the mechanism. And computing and artificial intelligence have perfectly good practical metaphors for expressing that. So there's, there's two separate metaphors. Well, they're not metaphors exactly, they're actual technolo technologies, but in this talk they function as metaphors. One is levels of programming language. If you know anything about programming language at all, you know the kind of code that people write, programmers nowadays, is a very long way from the kind of code that machines operate on, which is really just a string of noughts and ones which run registers in the machine. Right? You know, I think we all know that now, don't we? If you've heard of language like Algol, Lisp, C++, they are languages which are far, far away from the machine, but through layers of translation, and it is translation, those C programs are translated down and down and down until eventually end up as strings of ones and noughts, and once they are, the machine can run. This is all done in fractions of a second. Okay? So, in a way, this is very important because Minsky didn't make a lot of this image, but I'm pushing it now, and I've pushed it in the past. Um, the fact we can write programs in high-level language like C++ or even Lisp, um, uh, we don't have to know how they're going to be carried out. An awful lot of programming is about, and uh, disputes in programming theory, is about the degree to which you do need to know how your program is implemented. There are two schools of thought about this. I was brought up in the school of thought that it, you didn't need to know how your program was implemented, and it's best if you didn't. And that meant I programmed as a student in languages were enormously wasteful, because nobody knew how they, how they did it. It didn't matter. I just wrote, you know, do this, and they did it. I mean, imagine in the days of automated cars, in about five, ten years' time, you jump in a car and you say, take me to Wigan. <laughs> okay? Um, that, in a sense, is a high-level piece of program. From the point of view of the automated car, which is a, a computer on wheels, Take me to Wigan is a piece of high-level programming in English, and it will translate it down, and you'll get to Wigan. Um, that's what we mean by... Pro and this is a perfect metaphor for what Minsky meant by consciousness, and I think what a lot of philosophers meant by consciousness, that we only know the top level of the language, take me to Wigan, we've no idea how it's going to do it. It knows, it does it, but we don't know. And it's, I think that's an exact image of how I reach out my arm for the glass, and I don't know how my arm does this, I don't know why, I just want to drink... Um, my brain knows, my body knows, I don't. It's nowhere near my consciousness, is it? Okay. So, the other image, the other metaphor is modules. Back to Leibniz, the monodology. A very powerful image in certainly MIT AI, where Minsky came from, and in lots of other functional parts of AI, is the notion of module. And it's a notion in programming that a piece of program consists of a closed world, a closed box, Black box is the word sometimes used. That you see what goes into the black box and what comes out. But you don't care how it does the box, how the box does it. All you want to know is how that box interacts with these boxes. So you write the program as a mass of closed boxes which talk to each other. In, in, in one view of this, there is no box which is in charge of everything. The boxes simply interact and negotiate what to do. That's one programming idea. The other is there's a top, there's a top box that knows what the others should be doing as a sort of sergeant major box. This, of course, is exactly like Leibniz's monadology, where the god monad sees into all the other monads and knows everything. In fact, the monadology of Leibniz is exactly a prefiguring of the programming of modules. Uh, there's a famous phrase of Carl Hewitt, the, uh, the great programmer from El Paso, um, who <laughs> coined the phrase, modules shouldn't dicker about with each other's insights. And this was a sort of injunction in programming theory to, in other words, don't try and look inside the black boxes, you'll just confuse yourself. Just accept that it does it and be grateful. And uh, these are just matters of programming style, but I hope you see that both the, mo both the module and the programming level are two different real pieces of programming theory and dispute and law, which do both of them in a different way capture something of what we mean by consciousness, that one module could be conscious and the other modules won't be. One, the, the top level of the car that takes you to Wigan, you, you're conscious when you say that, the rest of it isn't. It doesn't know what it's doing or why. Okay. Um, 
we are, we are making progress. I promise you, I'm, I'm watching the what? I'm watching the clock. Um, so these views actually can be Dennettish. What I call Dennett. See, I mean, okay, we'll come to that in a moment. Look at it, yes. Look at it this way. Two ways of looking at the top level of control in humans and machines, both of which we could identify with consciousness. One view is this, which is I say we, I'm paraphrasing as Minsky's view, the AI view, if you like. Okay, we don't know how lower levels do things in machines. And that's essential to real control, to meaning and to intention, how my arm works. It's essential to control and to have overall control of plans that I don't know how the lower level works. Dennett, the opposition. We don't know how the lower levels of things work and where decisions are made, so the top level of consciousness is vacuous. So these are two views which are opposed, but we both accept that so much is going on outside the conscious realm, the conscious level, the conscious module, and one school takes it as meaning, therefore the consciousness is empty. It's all going, there's all kinds of psychological experiments that show that you think you take a decision which thing to pick, but brain analysis can show that your brain made the decision and then in a second or two before. A lot of people, like Dennett, take that as clear proof that they're right. I think it's not so simple, but you get the, the idea where the game is. Okay, so the opaqueness of programming language works in both directions, by the way, both of which are relevant to us. Downwards, as I just talked about, take me to Wigan, you say to the car, and you don't know downwards what it's going to do, but also upwards. Lots of philosophers have talked about the opacity upwards of programs. That if you just looked at the lights flashing on the front of a computer, you couldn't tell what it was doing. The lights flashing show you what the registers are doing, or they used to in the old days, They're not now. But the old days, the lights flashing showed you what was going on at the bottom level. You couldn't deduce from that whether it was paying your tax or directing atomic weapons. In other words, you couldn't, can't deduce the top level of program from the bottom. Now, some people now deny that, but it's still broadly true. If you look at a printout of the actual machine code of any program, you wouldn't have a clue what it's doing, a clue. You've got to be told. You've got to see the upper level translation that, as it were, expresses the meaning and intention of the program. Although, mind you, there's lots of detective work going on out there, especially in defense, to try and do exactly that. There's lots of American defense work that would like to uh, get hold of the machine code of programs by various methods of bad actors and work out what the program was doing. But it isn't, it isn't very successful. And another, another thing to lay on the table there is <clears throat> there's neural nets, you probably know, are one of the dominant themes in AI these days, and I've talked about them in previous lectures. There's a standard view in those people who are attracted to neural nets that if you have a neural net of sufficient size and complexity, it will become conscious. It, the word emergence is usually used. Make a thing complicated enough, big enough, interacting enough inside itself, it'll become conscious. I see absolutely no reason to believe this true, but it's an, an idea that doesn't go away by people who believe in neural nets. So, and another analogy, dropping the modules and the layers for a moment. Um, of course, some people have spotted, I think they have, or it can't be me. Um, could the World Wide Web be something like standing in now or becoming what Hegel talked about as this sort of worldwide consciousness layer of the human race. There is something very odd about the World Wide Web, isn't there? I mean, it seems to be outside all of us. It contains everything the human race knows. It's there. It's not real. Well, it is real. It's on gigantic servers in Washington State. But it's out there. And in some sense, I can't help feeling there's some resonance between that, the, web, the World Wide Web that knows everything, and us. It is somehow our consciousness externalized, and who knows where it's going to go. A lot of people have talked about it as if it will become, as it were, a version of us. I have no idea what that means. But there is something very strange about it. Our ancestors could not have imagined. So I think it would be if somebody came back from a 50 or 100, 100 years ago. 100 years ago, they had trains and planes, and they knew what television was and all this stuff. You know, They didn't know computers. But the World Wide Web, the idea that in your pocket is something that knows everything, I think would have been the most astonishing single thing they would have discovered today. And I can't help thinking there is something in that analogy, but I probably don't want to pursue it. Oh, I put a quote up there from Gibson, if you, if you know William Gibson is. He's the man who invented the word cyberspace. He invented a novel called Neuromancer in 1981. And if you were looking as I was talking, as you'd be better employed doing, at the words up there of William Gibson, you'll see that he, in his novel, is flirting with this idea of this vast human consciousness that knows everything because he, what she called cyberspace, he gave us the word. Okay, um, 
AI and panpsychism, just trying to draw the threads together now. Um, if everything's conscious, which is what panpsychism is in some sense, then of course machines are conscious too, so that's boring. That's not interesting. Uh, machines are conscious, but so are my shoes. So that, that ceases to be terribly attractive. Um, we want, if machines are going to be conscious, we want them to be conscious in something like the way we are. Otherwise, it isn't interesting, is it? Um, if we had lots of time, I'd like to talk about, I won't, about there's books on Japanese culture and its attitude to robots. So there's absolutely no doubt that the Japanese have a different attitude toward robots. They find it much more acceptable than we do. They're welcoming into their society and their homes much more than we are. And something to do with Japanese metaphysics, which has a pan-psychic element. There's an element in traditional Japanese metaphysics that spirits are in everything. And therefore, having spirits in machines is not as shocking to them as it is to us. And there is something at a metaphysical level in Japan. There's a, a woman called Robertson who's written a very interesting book. She speaks and writes Japanese and was brought up there. She's American. On Japanese metaphysics and robotics. And uh, it's called something like ooh, Homo Roboticus or something. It's a, it's a silly title. But if you look up Jennifer Robertson, it's a great book. And she convinced me that the Japanese approach to these things is different from us. And in a sense, it's panpsychic. There's an element of panpsychic in Japanese thinking that we don't have. Um, there's a man called Neil Lawrence who's just taken the machine learning chair at, at, at uh, Cambridge. And he has an interesting idea that consciousness will come, or consciousness will come in machines, because they transmit information at a different rate from us. He thinks our consciousness, I shouldn't just parody, he hasn't published this much, but in conversation, in conferences, he puts out this idea that machines can spew out information at an enormous speed. We can only spew out information at roughly the speed I'm talking, which is pretty slow, really. I mean, you know, not much is coming out of me. A machine in a nanosecond can give you, you know, a thousand copies of the Bible, a million copies of the Bible. Um, and he's saying that this has consequences and that we've been forced to develop consciousness uh, because we can only get mental content across at a very slow rate, that language only transmits to other people at a very slow rate. And therefore, so much of language understanding is based on the implicit mental structures in our heads. I assume, that's why it's hard to understand people in foreign languages and foreign ways of thinking. It's not because the languages are different, it's because they have different structures in their minds. And people who understand each other very well hardly need to say anything to each other because they, they have so much assumed they need to transmit what they do in very few words. We know that. Old couples at breakfast. We know, we know, we know. Sometimes it's depressing. It's one word and it says a mountain of things. But there's something in what Lawrence is saying. And he believes that human minds have developed complex knowledge structures which have ended up being conscious because of their very slow rate of information transfer between each other. So again, he goes back to this Julian James idea that consciousness is somehow connected with talking to ourselves and with the possession of language in the brain. I'm sure this is right. I, mean, I like collecting um, information, that get, things that go that way. Um, I've said this already, um, Lawrence, yes. Um, another colleague, a former colleague of mine, I'm going to go five more minutes, okay? Uh, five, six minutes, yeah. Uh, a former colleague of mine called Paul Bellow has come up with another interesting idea that I think is relevant, and he's an AI person, um, that intentional action requires consciousness. That we, I mean, this isn't new, I mean, it's what the courts think, isn't it? Men's ray in the courts, the guilty mind. In some sense, the courts are about judging intentional action, and that's connected to paying attention to what you're doing and not killing people by accident, which is usually called manslaughter. Okay, um, uh, but Bellow has kind of gone a bit further with this, and he's... Um, He's trying to argue, is a complex example which he stole from a philosopher called Chisholm. Uh, I don't know if it's worth wasting two minutes on the example. Here's the example. You intend to kill your uncle for inheritance. You're driving along, you're not paying attention to driving, and you knock somebody down. When you get out of the car, you find you've knocked down your uncle. You've killed your uncle. So, says Bellow, how do we describe this? You intended to kill your uncle. By chance, by not paying attention when you're driving, you've knocked down somebody, and it's your uncle. You've killed your uncle. Do we want to say, he says, that you intended what you just did? He wants to argue that you didn't. That's not the same as intentionally killing your uncle. This is a different kind of thing, because you have a lack of attention, lack of consciousness, consciousness and attention. I'm not sure I quite buy it, but I, and I, the, argument, the example is incredibly contrived, but I get the idea. There is something about consciousness 
and its focus on intentional action, which is exactly what Dennett denies, don't forget. Dennett thinks that our brain is really deciding, and we just think we are, but it's just a ghost. We're just deceived. Uh, I don't feel like that myself. If I want Japanese food for lunch, I want Japanese food for lunch. I mean, it's me. I'm saying it now. My brain didn't decide it two minutes ago. You know, you, you see how you can take different views on this, which doesn't settle anything scientific. Science isn't settled by what people feel about what they're doing. But still, we do have these strong feelings. Um, could there be... I'll, I'll end with these last few slides. Could there be experiments to detect if an AI was, thing was conscious? I suspect it would be very difficult, but people have been sticking their necks out. Um, some people have been complicated, uh, discussing complicated um, experiments. The Templeton Project to determine our brain electrical activity, whether one theory or another, which part of the brain activity takes place in. And I don't personally feel that whatever that settles, it will really settle whether whether a brain is conscious is because of where the activity is any more than it would settle it in a machine because of where its activity was. I don't feel very persuaded by that. Another man called Jan Polsky, who's, I think, more impressive, he's got the idea that a test for conscious machines would be whether they could discuss optical illusions intelligently. Suppose you gave a machine an optical illusion that was novel. In other words, it couldn't have found out already. Uh, not, so not the duck rabbit or those ones, a new optical illusion, and you got its dialogue part to discuss with you the optical illusion and could it see the two interpretations of the illusion. And he somehow argues, uh, not completely convincingly, but it's an interesting idea, that you would have to be in some sense conscious to be comparing the two interpretations of this figure and discussing it. And he thinks, if a machine could do that, he thinks he might be prepared to say it was conscious. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe zombies could do that. I don't know. Um, it's an interesting idea. The takeaway thoughts, then, um, the end. Um, so you get a chance to talk. Um, AI may not need consciousness, but may get it if we could work out how we knew it succeeded, how if we knew if we, if we knew how we'd done it. Supposing, as it were, either because of a neural net is of sufficient complexity or because something about Jan Polsky and the discussion of optical illusions, if something did dis cause us to think this machine was conscious, if you watch your TV for these, I mean, these programs are coming on TV at a rate of knots now. Do you remember the Humans program about two years ago? I don't know if any of you saw it. This was a very interesting thought piece on robots living in the home, having affairs with one of the family members, um, you know, uh, of course, it was a very nice, well-trained actress, of course, so you had no difficulty believing she was conscious. But, of course, in fact, in the newspaper, she gave a very interesting discussion of what it was as an actress to be trained to act like a machine. I thought that was quite interesting. It was a kind of action, training that actors don't get. It was a completely novel experience to be trained to act as a machine. And she was very convincing. Anyway, so, in other words, science fiction, television, or exploring these ideas, what would it be like to have these machines that are going to be living with us? They are. More and more, we know that, we know about that. W what it's going to be like to come to believe their consciousness, conscious, excuse me, and would it be an advantage, would it be a great disadvantage, as I hinted with the, I hinted earlier that um, there'd be new moral and social problems if they were. The revolution would come round again just when we thought we got it off the agenda. Whoops, back it comes. And I still think, and this is, um, I've said several things along these lines, that somewhere wherever consciousness is, is connected to our ability to talk to ourselves. I'm sure Shakespeare talked to himself. I'm sure Plato talked to himself. I think all the cleverest people of the past talked to themselves, even if not everybody did. And that their notion of consciousness, if they had one, they probably didn't, was somehow connected with that. And that James is right. I mean, after all, if humans have evolved from a very primitive, you know, if Homo sapiens goes back, oh, I don't know, what is it now? 100,000 years, I can't remember. Some big number. Homo sapiens goes back a long way. And before Homo sapiens, there's Homo something else with a bit sort of bit nastier, sort of bit nastier skull than you know. But but made little pots and did old scribblings on walls. But you know, clearly, whatever consciousness is, and assuming we've got it somewhere in that line, for some people, it came in. I think there's no doubt. We know language came in, but we can't find out because there's no evidence because we can't. We can't know. We weren't there. There's no records. Same with consciousness. But we sort of know intuitively there must have been a point where it came in and probably came in before Plato and Shakespeare. Um, so we, if it is a historical phenomenon, it would be interesting to know what it was about us 
that caused us to say that people were conscious, and I'm quite convinced it's language. I can't imagine a language-free person being conscious in the way we are, but when I say that, I then doubt it the minute I've said it, because I want to stick up for dogs, um, I want to think there are disabled people with no language, and they probably are conscious. So, I mean, the fact that language may have something to do with the origin of consciousness doesn't mean there can't be conscious things that don't have language. Maybe it's all going to fall back on some form of dear old panpsychism, that there are going to be consciousness in different ways, and if dogs are conscious, they aren't conscious like us, and people with language maybe not be conscious like articulate bunch of people like you. I mean, I don't know. We don't know. We can't tell. But I still think that language comes in there somewhere because language has been my stock in trade and has given me a perfectly good living for about 60 years. Anyway, thank you very much.